okay. Um, good evening to everybody. We're going to start without further uh, uh, waiting because uh, our guest also has, a, has to catch a train back to, to Manchester, so we're better to start now and have more time. Um, well, as you know probably from the announcement, but this is uh, uh, part of a series that started uh, 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 in 2007 here at SOAS called the Globalization Lecture Series. And actually we are coming to the end of the cycle and uh, with uh, uh, this uh, lecture we'll still have one more uh, in December. I'm not announcing it yet with fingers crossed because the person who was supposed to come uh, couldn't get the visa uh, uh, last year. So I hope this will be settled this, this time. So you'll hear of that uh, in, uh, in due time. Um, <clears throat> Today, I mean, this, this evening, we have, I mean, it's my, my great uh, pleasure and uh, privilege to, uh, to, to, uh, to welcome uh, Eric uh, Swingedo, uh, who um, is a professor of, uh, of geography at the University of, of Manchester uh, in the School of uh, in Environment and Development. Uh, Eric is uh, from Belgium originally. He was born in, in Flemish-speaking uh, Belgium, and uh, he knows he's fluent in uh, in four languages: Dutch, French, the languages of Belgium, uh, English, and uh, English, of course, and uh, and and Spanish. Uh, and some of you know or are familiar with actually his uh, his work on uh, on Spain. Uh, he graduated <coughs> uh, with an MSc in uh, bioengineering, in uh, agricultural, agricultural engineering uh, in Belgium, in uh, Louvain, the Catholic University of Leuven, in 1979. Uh, and then went uh, a few years later for another uh, master, this time in urban and regional uh, planning, also from, uh, from uh, Leuven. <coughs> His uh, PhD uh, in geo geogra geography and environmental engineering uh, was uh, uh, constituted of a thesis on the production of new spaces of production. And I'm sure even the, the kind of title uh, immediately bring uh, to mind for those who are familiar with, uh, with uh, his work uh, well, the work of, uh, of, uh, of his uh, supervisor, David Harvey. Who is, uh, I was telling Eric that uh, David Harvey is uh, very well known uh, to our students at SOAS and very present in the, the teaching that, uh, that, uh, that we, we, we provide here. Uh, <coughs> Eric has been from 88 until 2006 professor of geography at Oxford, at the University of Oxford, fellow of uh, St. Peter's College. And he moved in 2006 to, to Manchester, uh, where he has the, the, the chair that I described, is the author of, uh, of uh, uh, very numerous uh, publications, a lot of articles, essays, uh, edited books, and books of his known mo monographs. Uh, uh, with uh, a few themes coming out of, uh, of that as, a, as someone uh, uh, who's uh, developed in the, in the wake of, of David Harvey's work, there's a, a lot of, uh, of work from, with this imprint and on, on uh, cities, on, uh, well, also the, the, the background in, uh, in urban and regional planning shows in a lot of his titles. I'm not going to, to read this, it's something you can uh, get uh, uh, the list, I mean, of, of writings on, on his website or even on Wikipedia, or part of them in, uh, in the library here. Uh, his um, two most uh, recent books is uh, uh, one he edited with uh, Jeffy uh, Wilson, uh, and ca which uh, came out uh, last year, and which is, of course, narrowly linked to the topic of this uh, uh, presentation, 
the title of, of the book is The Post-Political and Its uh, Discontents, Spaces of Depolit Depoliticization, Specters of Radical Politics. That came out last year and this year again in paperback, uh, Edinburgh University Press. And then his uh, very latest uh, book that came out uh, just uh, at the beginning of the summer, uh, Liquid Power Contested Hydro Modernities in 20th Century Spain. And here again is Spain that I just mentioned. So without further delay, let me, uh, please join me in welcoming Eric Swingedal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gilbert. It's a pleasure to be here and a privilege uh, to have been invited by Soas and Gilbert to present this lecture this evening. As you've heard from Gilbert's introduction, I've always been interested in radical politics, and in particular, the articulation between radical politics and the urban. The way in which many of us, David Harvey included, have done that over the past 30 years or so, since the 1970s, 1980s, is more or less the following way, is that we assumed that the substantive theorization of the social, the economic, and the urban would give us the instruments, the tools, the tactics, if not the strategies, of mobilizing or engaging in radical politics. Marxists have always made this their staple. We have to understand capitalism in order to fight it. And of course, feminists, post-colonialists, and others have more or less made the same claims. We first have to critically understand the multiple axes around which power, the exclusion, and unevenness is structured in order to come up with the strategies and tactics that can change, potentially, the modalities of inequality, disempowerment, and exclusion. The point I want to make in a sort of roundabout way this evening is that that may possibly, hypothetically, have been a mistake. That we might want to revisit this implicit assumption that there is a relationship between substantive critical theorization of the kind that I mentioned and radical or progressive political action. In contrast to that, I'm going to argue that what is urgently required for us, intellectuals and theoreticians of the city and urbanization, is to foreground the political more centrally, to think through what the political is or might be today at the beginning, it's not any longer the beginning anymore, of the 21st century, and what the relationship, if any, is between your political theorization, political mobilization, and the transformation of the urban order. So what I'm not going to do is engage with the sort of work that people like Saskia Sassen have done, or Neil Brenner and others, who said, well, if you really want to understand urbanization today, you have to do it in the context of the process of planetary urbanization that sa shapes the conditions of combined and uneven geographical development, blah, 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 etc. And through that, a proper understanding of that, we will come up with a better set of tactics and strategies to deal with radical politics in uh, Istanbul, Kathmandu, or London. I don't think that's the case. So I'm going to take another tack. I'm going to talk about insurgent practices in the planetary city and to articulate that through examining what I would consider to be a paradoxical situation. And the paradoxical situation is the following. On the one hand, a number of 
more or less influential authors. I put up two here, because there's Aramajo, the late Nobel Prize winning Portuguese novelist, on the one hand, and Russell Brandt, stand-up comedian, um, all around bad boy, who in their very different ways say exactly the same thing. There's nothing they claim that we can any longer do with the democratic. Just a facade, Saramago says. Something he explores wonderfully well in his, I think it was his last novel, Seeing, um, where, he, uh, where he chronicled the disintegration in a certain way of the democratic spectacle and the reimagining of what the democratic might be by chronicling the unfolding of a democratic procedure in this little town that he'd been written about at least two more times. Most of you are familiar with City of the Blind, now, this wonderful novel where situated in this town where everyone went magically, strangely blind, except for one woman, which was basically an allegory of the disintegration of civilization as we know it. In seeing, it's of course the disintegration of the democratic condition. It's a story where people do precisely as Russell Brandt calls us to do, stop voting, there is no point. This is your Agamben, who also, in his own radical philosophical manner, tries to explore this strange year process, alleged year process of deep politicization, where he says there is a shift. There has been a shift from the model of the polis, that's because the, the name the political name of the city, the city as a political space, as a space for civic and public engagement versus the city as this kind of geographical concentration, accumulation of bodies and stuff in places like London. There's a shift on the model of the pole is founded on the center, there's a public center at Agora, to a new metropolitan spatialization that is certainly invested in a process of depoliticization. This is quite a common argument made that we all have been, over the past decade or so, living in, a, in under conditions of radical depoliticization. Clearly manifested in the fact that most people, certainly my students, when I take a straw poll and ask them, did you vote last time? And I get 20, 30 percent of university students who exercised their democratic citizenship entitlement. We had elections in Greece just a few weeks ago where the turnout was an all-time low for the Greek standards. It was around 50 or 55 percent. This is well documented and chronicled. Yet, in this sphere of deep politicization, we've seen the kind of strange return of massive outbursts of discontent centered around cities, around the world, hopping from center to center, from city to city, operating under a variety of names, operating under very different, very heterogeneous social, economic, and political conditions. Yet, where there seems to be, although we don't know precisely how, a sort of uncanny affinity when these outbursts of urban discontent leapfrog from uh, Cairo, from Tunis to Cairo, from Cairo to Athens, from Athens to Thessaloniki, from Thessaloniki to Madrid, from Madrid to Barcelona, from Barcelona to Istanbul, from Istanbul to Santiago de Chile, from Santiago de Chile to Tel Aviv, from Tel Aviv to Hong Kong, from Hong Kong to Hamburg. 
This is a paradoxical situation. Where, on the one hand, there's this argument of deep-seated depoliticization, yet, at least since the magical year 2011 and its aftermath, the multiple and massive expression of insurrectional movements that basically say, we have enough. We do not any longer accept what goes for democracy or what is understood as such in the particular urban and national context in which we operate. So these are just a few of the more evocative names that we have become to associate with this multiplication of urban, planetary, urban, your political discontent. How can we make sense of this apparent paradox? This is the most latest one, uh, one of the latest ones in, in Frankfurt at the, on the occasion of the opening of the new headquarters of the European Central Bank, this new sort of European policing agent ask the Greek people what they think of the democratic nature of this Frankfurt-based institution. Now, many would consider these outbursts as impotent, impotent outbursts um, that flare up and which a bunch of people have fun for a while. It's a great spectacle of enjoyment that for a few weeks, at best a few months, shake in a certain way, in a spectacular way, the status quo, but then things return to normal. Well, I would like to suggest that perhaps these movements are politically more performative than what than what my, one might expect. In 2013, in Davos, you know, Davos is this name of a little town where the assorted elites of the world come together to chart out, to organize the making geographical of their dream of what a good world is all about. It's not my dream, but they clearly have a dream of how to transform the geographical organization of places and cities and countries according to their own imaginary. And of course, they all know as well as we know that those imaginaries do not become real without resistance, without all manner of obstacles put in place by people like us. So every year at Davos, the World Risk Report is published. It's a wonderful read, the World Risk Report, because it's, of course, an analysis of what the greatest obstacles and risks are to the assembled elites that stand in the way of the potential realization of their bad dream for the world. So, for example, in 2011, of course, it was the financial crisis. In 2013, the number one risk that the World Economic Forum identified in their 600-page World Risk Report was called Seeds of Dystopia. I had to read the whole goddamn 600 pages to figure out what they meant by Seeds of Dystopia. And, of course, what they meant was the extraordinary proliferation of outbursts of urban discontents of the kind that I was referring to. They, of course, refer to it as seas of dystopia. It's not the kind of metaphor that I would have used for these kind of outbursts, but it did suggest that to a certain extent they had a kind of performativity. It shook up a bit the certainties that usually accompany these sort of meetings. In the aftermath of those insurrectional moments, which are of necessity short-lived, 
Bactinian outburst of great spectacles, which of course are, are not sustainable. They cannot be sustained. That is of course not the issue. You can't go on occupying public squares and cities for the rest of your life, because that's not life. The whole point, of course, is to get home and have a life, right? But have a different sort of life. So the key question, of course, is not one of this continuous, impotent occupying of places. However important it is, I would consider them to be really vital, but ultimately pre-political events that may or may not, and only under certain very specific conditions and configurations, may lead to the slow, difficult process of politicization that begins in a variety of ways to change the common sense of everyday life, because that is what, of course, those collected insurgents want to achieve, a change in the common sense of the world. That what was considered nonsensical today that that becomes commonsensical the next day. So I am very intrigued in the diverse modalities to which, under certain circumstances, these outbursts might signal. And I'm uncertain, theoretically and empirically, how the two actually hang together. I don't have a, an answer, but there is. I would insist, some sort of connectivity between these urban outbursts of radical discontent and processes of emergent repoliticization, the kind of process that goes under the variegated names of Syriza in Greece, Podemos in Spain, right to the city movement in Poland and other places, the HDP in Turkey, or perhaps Corbyn in the UK. So, let me try to say something then about these insurgent cities. So first, I, I want to explore for a moment, theoretically, this kind of strange, paradoxical si situation. Uh, where on the one hand, there is this argument of depoliticization, the argument that I and many others have made that we are today living in post-democratic or post-geopolitical configurations, a configuration that radically disavows the political. Which then, of course, asks the question of what do I mean by the political? And I want to say something briefly about a series of theoretical perspectives that tries to account for, hold together, this strange paradoxical situation between a depoliticized polity on the one hand and the re-emergence of the political as manifested in these mass movements of radical discontent. They then say something about how this articulates with these insurgent urban movements that I exemplified. To conclude, to ask myself with Alain Badiou whether what we have seen over the past few years is just a blip, or whether it may signal the re-beginning, the re-awakening, as Badiou calls it, the re-awakening of history, history understood as the process of emancipatory struggle. So let me first say something about the dynamics of depoliticization. When I use the word post politicization I usually get the classic and fairly trivial objection that the prefix post seems to suggest that once upon a time things were the political, but that today they're not any longer. And I do admit that this prefix of post is somewhat misleading. However, I like to use it in the way in which people like Zizek and Rancière are mobilizing the concept of post depoliticization as a particular figure or dispositive of depoliticization. So post depoliticization I'll give some content in a moment, is a process of a particular kind by which the political is evacuated from 
the spaces of public engagement. There are other such tactics, which Rancière uh, defines as archive politics, parapolitics, or metapolitics. Let me exemplify one of them. Metapolitics is the classic Marxist of a certain type, Marxist ploy, when in argument they tell, they tell you, if you want to do politics, change the economy, struggle over the ownership of the means of production. That's a metapolitics, yeah? where the terrain of the political is displaced onto a different terrain in this case the terrain of the social organization, the class configuration of production, and then saying, if we change that, everything will be fine. That's a meta-political evacuation of the political. So let me try to explore the contours of the present process of post-depoliticization, something that is very clearly visible I think, in the current stru uh, structures, practices, and mechanisms of urban governance. So post-depoliticization is a process of consensualizing techno-managerial forms of governance, whereby the political sphere has been reduced to a set of contested debates over issues that are accepted as contentious, yet well, only the techno-managerial configuration can be disputed, while the frame under which these problems appear cannot be addressed. This process of post-depoliticization has a set of characteristics. It is sustained by the invocation of a permanent state of emergency, of crisis. The tropes around which emergency becomes continuously staged as one of the vehicles through which radical political dispute becomes evacuated is around four key issues. The economy. Trust us, the elites say, say, we know the situation is difficult, but trust us. We have a set of techno-managerial processes ready that will make sure that civilization as we know it can go on. The migration, the environment, and security. The second characteristic of depoliticization under post geopolitical conditions is the process by which contentious choices are reduced to a Excel accountancy spreadsheet. It is that only those choices are rendered legitimate that adhere to an economic calculus. If I were to say today to my students, higher education should be free for all those who are willing and have the capacity to go to higher education, most would say that I'm a dinosaur who has forgotten that the 20th century is forever <laughs> finished. So this is what is meant by the economization of politics. Well, at the same time, there is a process of the depoliticization of the economic sphere. That is, the modalities through which we organize the transformation of nature, that the economy, the modalities through which we distribute that organization of the transformation of nature. And the consequences thereof, that the economy, the production and distribution of goods and services cannot be depoliticized. That cannot be rendered contentious. And all this is sustained by, by, by expert management, the governance today through expert management in which, of course, the biopolitical happiness of the population is the generally accepted and officially proclaimed objective of policy making. These forms of post-political governance are increasingly managed to what I and others have called 
autocratic forms of post-democratic governance beyond the state. Colin Crouch is probably the one, the political sociologist who has paid greatest attention to the evacuation of the democratic substance of the configurations of governance that govern our cities, countries, and the region. A classic example of that is the European Union or the Troika. Is that a state? Well, not quite. Is it an apparatus of governance? Surely is. What is its democratic accountability? Legitimacy? Representation? And you can find that at all possible scales. This transformation of the democratic content of the registers of governance is actually fully endorsed. This is fully endorsed. This is fully recognized. It's fully recognized in the demand for and open invitation for participation. A participatory governance has in Europe and elsewhere become one of the key features through which the democratic lacuna ought to be remedied. Of course, what one of my colleagues in Manchester called the tyranny of participation is nothing else than a symptom of the decline of the democratic and certainly stands not as a recipe for the transformation of the, demo the, the non-democratic content of the new registers of post-democratic governance. So in such configuration, of course, dispute is still possible. Dispute is in fact properly acknowledged and invited. But this dispute over the techno-managerial arrangements of the generally recognized problematic. Next month in Paris, you will see undoubtedly yet again a beautiful example of that in Paris when the global leaders will try to deal with the climatic catastrophe we are already in and which will invariably unfold over a techno-managerial dispute over a few percentage points. What is censored is what Jacques Rancière would call dissensus, the radical disagreement over different ways of, or of, of organizing the social institutional configuration of our life. So in that sense, Fukuyama, when he more than 20 years ago argued that history is over, was actually right. History is indeed over. However, this idyll of a post-democratic form of consensual politics is strangely enough continuously disrupted by the fragmenting forces that cut through this idyll of consensus. Take, for example, the lure of identity and how many of our urban violent outbursts or not all of them, but some of them, articulated around the law of identity. A law of identity that, of course, is matched by the governing elites in a very particular way. Remember when Manchester and London were burning two years ago? What Cameron called those who were here protesting? Scum. The French word for that is arakai. The old Greek word for that is ochlos, which stands against the demos. The ochlos are those who are not entitled to be part of the polis. But of course, the consensual arrangements of post-political governance is also cut through not just by politics of identity, but also by politicizing forms of 
outbursts of discontent. This is a picture of Madrid in 2011, when the Indignados occupied Puerta del Sol, Plaza del Catalunya, etc. And you can all understand enough Spanish to read the slogan, Democracia Real Ya. That's a bit of an odd slogan, is it not? In Madrid, this is not Cairo, but it might make sense. This is in Madrid. Real democracy now. This is a scandalous statement, given, given that Spain has gone through a tremendous an allegedly extraordinarily successful process of democratization after having suffered one of the longest dictatorships of the 20th century in Europe between 1939 and 1975. So no one would question that Spain is a properly constituted democracy and here there are a bunch of people, well, a few hundred thousand, that we want real democracy now. So there's here an odd sort of tension contradiction between the insurgent democratic demands and expressions articulated by these heterogeneous insurgents on the one hand and instituted forms of quote unquote democratic organization. And some of those, as I've suggested, have begun to translate into performative forms of politicization in Turkey, Greece, Spain, and indeed, possibly here. So how can we make sense of this? I think it's useful in this context to recall one of Michel Foucault's later works. The last lectures he gave to, to the Collège de France in 1979 and 1980, which were much more centrally concerned with the politics of liberalism and neoliberalism, much more than with the capital micropolitics that marked his earlier work. In one of his uh, lectures, he said, the people, and of course he means here, the people as a political category, as a democratic political category, is those who, refusing to be the population, is refusing to be the objects of biopolitical governance, disrupt the system. That's quite an extraordinary statement to make, because it does pit insurgent political movements against instituted politics. So in order to make theoretical sense of that, I found it useful to uh, look at some of the more of the recent post-foundational political thought, which actually goes back several decades. But by distinction is made between politics on the one hand and the political on the other. The French, the beautifully gendered language it, it is, calls it respectively le politique and la politique. Lo politico, la politica in Spanish. Die Politik, das Politische in German. The importance of separating these two out is not to suggest that there is some sort of dialectical articulation between instituted politics on the one hand and the disruptive processes that undermine and interrupt these institutions. No, they're actually radically distinct and different. There's no connection between the two. La politique, politics refers to what is the ontic of everyday policy making. It's the stuff of a political scientists. It refers to the rituals of participation through the democratic channels of voting, 
the assemblies from the city council, national parliament, European parliaments that institutionally organize this, the analysis of the various sociological agents and actors that shape and structure the policy making process, and which is always and of necessity somewhat oligarchic. We know that. Every single one of our substantive theorizations shows us convincingly that any form of governance is, to a certain extent, unequal, disempowering for some while empowering for others. In other words, is to a certain extent autocratic. The political, in contrast to that, le politique, is that that stands for, is the name that stands for the radical heterogeneity that cuts through the social. In other words, the political is the name, the word, that stands for the fact that society does not exist. So Thatcher was right here, but on very different grounds. The political is the name that stands for the fact that we radically disagree. That there is no such thing as a coherent society. And it's precisely the political that manifests itself. So what are the moments when radical disagreement and radical heterogeneity become expressed? is the moment when those who disagree stand up and show their disagreement. So I would argue that the urban insurgencies that we've seen are nothing else than manifestations of the political at work. I don't want to go to the theoretical details uh, um, of that. What I have not yet considered, which I want to briefly consider, is if the political is the world that stands for radical heterogeneity and that manifests itself the moment when the people, in the Foucauldian sense of the world, that is not the majority of the population, that is the moment when those who disagree stand up. You remember in 2010, 11, when in Cairo, the Egyptian people were rising up, that was all over the media. And I joined the Egyptian people with rising up. This was, of course, a lie. Or when the indignado said, we, the Spanish people, that's a lie. This is a tiny minority, sociologically speaking. A few hundred thousand people who metaphorically stand, but in no way sociologically or politically stand for the whole of the population. In fact, they stand exactly for the opposite of that. So the democratic, the political, I would argue, insist that the place of power is structurally vacant. Well, in other words, that anyone and everyone can temporarily occupy the place of power. It presumes equality. It presumes your political equality. That's a presumption, axiomatic. We know that sociologically speaking, we're unequal. Our sociological theorists have told us that in thousands of different ways. We're unequal along gender, ethnic, class, and other terms. Right? Much of progressive politics was based still on trying to remedy the sociologically observed in inequalities. Now, this has nothing to do, I would insist, with the notion of political equality, which is the presumption of equality. It presumes that we're all equal in the face of empirically verifiable inequalities. It insists, the democratic insists on the egalitarian capacity of each and all to act politically. It affirms that there is no pre-given society. In other words, it affirms the absent ground of society by recentering the political as the egalitarian capacity of each and all to act politically. 
And it's precisely here that we begin to discern the gap between the democratic and democracy. Michel Abensur argued indeed that the political is an emergent property that operates at a distance from the state, that operates versus politics and the police. So from that perspective, if we now go back to articulating the political as I explored it through these variegated forms of urban insurgencies that have choreographed so much of urban life over the past few years. I would argue, with Rancière and others, that the political can be understood as a retroactively revealed moment of eruption. An event that opens up a procedure that disrupts any given socio-spatial order. One that addresses a wrong in the name of an utterly contingent but axiomatic presumption of equality of each and every one. This wrong is a condition in which the presumption of equality is perverted through the institution of an always oligarchic police order. So the political, as an imminent practice, appears in the act of performatively staging equality. It's a procedure that simultaneously makes visible the wrong of the given situation, transgresses the fantasy of the order that insists that there is no alternative possible, and demands the impossible. And it does so by inaugurating the potential of inst instituting a new world. My favorite example here is, 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 is Rosa Parks, I guess, 1955, African-American woman who put a black bum on the wrong seat of the bus. It was not the first time that that happened. It happened many times before. She knew precisely what she was doing, of course. And she was, at the same time, expressing a wrong and performing equality. When that happened, one usually encounters with the wrath and the violence of governance, of the police. In this case, but only retroactively, we can identify it as the inaugural, moment, the inaugural moment of what later would be called the civil rights movement. So the political event cannot be decided a priori. The political event cannot be decided while it's ongoing, only retroactively in the unfolding of the performative procedures of politicization that an event can be identified as a political event that unleashes a process of democratic transformation. So what can we then say about the insurgent urban acting as political acting? Yes, first of all, insurgent democracy operates against the state, emerges as a distance from the state. It's what Alain Badiou calls engaged in the politics of subtraction. Secondly, there is no foundational place location or subject. Insurgent democracy is characterized by a process of common subjectivation that cuts through the standard sociological markers of political subjectivation. That is, that these insurgents could not be easily identified as proletarians, men, women, young, old, it was the appearance of a common political subject. The political 
appears as a very specific, very concrete, and very particular, but stands in its specific, concrete particularity as the metaphorical condensation of the universal. That's why it can be so readily identified as a democratizing movement against the identitarian expressions of discontent that also accompany the post-geopolitical order. Urban democratic acting revolves around the tropes of emergence, insurrection, and spatializing equality. It's an interruption in the order of the sensible. And its main aim is the reframing of a common sense. It is the making of a new world within the world. And most importantly, it does not happen in lecture theaters like this. It operates in and through the metaphorical and material production of its own spatiality without spatialization, politicization is impotent. So to conclude now, can we begin to discern in those movements and their aftermath a reawakening of history? I don't know. But what I want to conclude with is a set of questions, theoretical, questions that I believe are important for those who still believe in the possibility of a radical emancipatory project in the 21st century. Because that's the choice we're faced with. It's a choice we're faced with. Either we mobilize the best of our humanitarian capabilities to manage the state of the situation to the best of our ability, and that's fine, or we inscribe ourselves within the politicizing movements that believe and fight for a transformation of the common sense towards a more egalitarian and solidarity-based order. Many interlocutors have argued that these insurgent urban movements are political. I have my doubts about that. I would call them pre-political. But such pre-political outbursts of discontent are absolutely vital. And we know some of the contours of that. They're highly localized. They bring together in a contracted manner all sorts of people in a moment and period of intensified acting which in itself is not sustainable, but in there, uh, coming together in this intense way, prefigure some of the modalities of a transformed democratic acting. The questions that open up in the aftermath of such insurrectional events, that's when the public spaces is cleared, the tents are packed, and people go home again to live their ordinary everyday life as they should. Is how the question becomes, how can the practices, desires, be sustained beyond the Bactinian spectacle? How can the particular acting out that you would find in Syntagma Square, Taksim Square, be universalized. And we've seen in Turkey, for example, HDK doing this with the consequences of that. You probably saw the images yesterday, which were in some, some way undoubtedly connected with this process of politicization. How can we sustain the transformation and transgression of the symbolic order? In other words, how can we move indeed to a positive dialectic of transformation and get out of the infernal cycle of resistance, which in 
much of the literature that I come across, particularly in the Anglo-Saxon world, is the horizon of what is possible. How can we move from resistance to an egalitarian order to a process of action transforming an egalitarian order? What are the stages and, pra and practices of realizing the impossible, yet things that are immediately realizable? In other words, as a geographer, I think one of the key questions is how under what form and what condition can the urban event be spatialized so that the process of planetary urbanization that we're living in can correspond to politicizing process of universalizing equality. Now, in order to do that, I think what these insurgencies seem to suggest is that the political names of emancipatory struggle that have animated progressive politics in the 19th and 20th century are not any longer performative. I would argue that the privileged subject position of the proletarian that animated so much of 19th, 20th century radical politics needs to be visited in light of the heterogeneous forms of subjectivation that have animated and still animate the new emancipatory politics. I also think that these insurgencies shows and demonstrated that the traditional means of organizing progressive struggle, the political party as the organizing vehicle through which to structure, organize, and strategize with respect to emancipated politics is not any longer viable. And that is an urgent need expressed in practice, but where theoretically we have very little to um, contribute, is what is the form of organization adequate to the new forms of politicization that we're seeing. And what is the terrain of struggle? What is the terrain of power to be occupied? And I think what both these insurgents, as well as the forms of planetary urbanization suggest, is that the state cannot any longer be the single and privileged form of the terrain to which power has to be occupied. So how do we confront the day after? It's the day after blues. Not many of you feel a bit bluesy after the joys of the insurrections of 2012, 2013. After the joy of Syriza winning for the first time in the post-war history of Europe, the extreme left-wing party winning the elections being smashed. So I think there's an urgent agenda here to think through the day after. How we can move from the seeds of dystopia that the World Economic Forum was talking about, can move to the ideal of the possible. How can the process be sustained? What are the political procedures in the form of organization the subjectivities, the terrain around which a progressive politics today has to articulate. And most importantly, perhaps, how do we confront the violence, the unspeakable violence that invariably meets the moment that real democratizing political forces show some form of effectiveness. Over the summer, I was, and I'll, I'll finish with that, over the summer, I was extraordinarily intrigued, not being in the UK over the summer, but reading this extraordinary story about Corbyn and the violence, the extraordinary violence, discursive as it is, may be, that has been mobilized. And I then think, if these kind of Radical politicizations 
started to become even more performative, performative as Syriza did. If you consider the past between January and July, the extraordinary violence inflicted by the combined national and international elites to make sure that nothing really happened. So I think this is one of the great intellectual and practical challenges that faces any kind of democratic emancipatory procedure. That is how to confront the violence of those who, by all means possible, will try to make sure that nothing really changes. I leave it with that. Thank you very much. <laughs>